Probably by now, in our gaming careers, we've all played the part of heroic adventurers, tasked with defeating a great evil or establishing a colony on a far-off biome. But let's take a moment and pour out a mana potion for those tireless shopkeeps who keep us all in the bracers, greaves, and staves that make those journeys possible. Today's game is Merchants of Magic from designer Clarence Simpson, putting you and up to seven more of your friends behind the counter of an outfitter caring not only about precious gold and not at all about the giant threat looming over all of creation. So long as we get our GP, we're good. This provided review copy comes to us from publisher Rock Manor Games. So let's take a look inside, shall we? The unboxing of this one is a pretty stale affair, unfortunately. We have a simple rule book, which does a very good job of explaining the game, a pad of score sheets absolutely begging to be laminated, and past those, a large center channel box design. Now granted, we were given enough baggies that this one can live easily in the correct vertical orientation on your shelf, but other than that, this box isn't much to write home about. Additionally, you'll want to replace these golf pencils immediately. Do yourself a large favor and for your first few games, get something that can erase. You're for sure going to change your mind at some points during the play. Fortunately, what's inside here, the game itself, is far, far better. Let me show you what I mean faster than Wandering Oaken can say, Yoo-hoo, Midsummer Blowout! Merchants of Magic is a set of watch tales set in that universe, so players familiar with that game will recognize the art style and some of the sponsored adventurers here. In our game, we're given 10 rounds to construct various magical equipment for our more war-minded customers. To do so and earn their precious coin, we will use these dice to gather the materials and energies needed, combine them into finished products, and fulfill the rotating set of orders. After all, you're not the only shop in town. Each round begins with one player rolling all four of the game's dice and then entering those values next to the dice icons at the top of the sheet. You will then choose two of them to fulfill the requirements listed below the dice columns here in the middle. The crafting section requires dice of the listed number to be higher or equal to on the six eight and ten sided dice, while the research section wants the number or lower to be shown on the eight, ten, and twelve sided dice. Choose which die you're going to use and then fill in the circle below. In this example, I will use the three value on the eight sided die to fill in the requirement here of three or lower in the renowned accessories charm. If filling in a circle completes a given object or enchantment, you'll circle the name and gain a potion for your efforts, as well as the given end game gold. But why, Nicholas? What's it all about? Fellow merchants, is the work not reward enough? Is a shopkeep not entitled to the sweat of their brow, to paraphrase Andrew Ryan? Kids these days. Well, you're in luck. There is a lot more to it. After all, what good is a shop without orders? First of all, each player is assigned a sponsored adventurer at the beginning of the game. These coin-laden sods are desperate for a full kit of gear, and you're the only one they trust to make it. Our adventurer is this lady barbarian who fights for her fellow orcs. She'll give us five gold to outfit her with a scroll of the orcs, warhammer of the orcs, and a helmet of, you guessed it, the orcs. While the five coins are only given to us if we complete all three of her orders, fulfilling the first one will let us fill in this circle here, gaining us three potions. The second order allows us to fill in any other circle on the sheet we want, as will the third order. Additional orders will be circling the table, representing wandering lesser adventurers desperate just to get the piece they need and not particularly caring who makes it. At the end of each of the game's 10 rounds, you will take the leftmost order in front of you and pass it to the player on your left, gaining a new order from the player on your right, that you will then have the chance to fulfill in the next round. Any order you are able to craft in a round by completing or having already completed the listed requirements on the card can immediately be added to your pile, replacing it with a face-down card from the top of the order deck. There's some additional manipulation elements in these potion tokens, which sometimes feel gluttonous, and other times you'll wonder just who you need to threaten with a magical dragon attack in order to get just a couple more. As dice are generally fickle beasts to begin with, I wanted to make note of some interesting things that this game does to mitigate them. First of all, the requirements on your sheet will never change, from game to game, obviously, but also round to round. You always know what you need to get. On top of that, while it's true that if you want to construct plate armor at any point during a game, you'll need to spend at least two potion tokens in order to increase your six-sided die 
to eight. For the most part, you're given the option of using multiple dice to achieve your goals. This works really well for the most part, ensuring that if you want to enchant anything with divine power, you'll need to roll a two or lower, but you're also given both the 10 and 12 sided dice to make it happen, Captain. A couple of quick notes on what might strike you as disappointing about this one, and spoiler alert, it isn't much. My preview copy has a couple of dice that don't really read correctly as far as the colors go. The red is browner than I'd like, and the D10 would only charitably be described as yellow. That being said, Rock Manor Games let me know that they're aware of this issue, and the final product dice should match the Pantone chains they originally envisioned. Also. While the game does indeed play well with eight players, you're gonna have component issues in these potion tokens. The rulebook addresses this as well, though less desirably than the dice problem. The three different colors of these potions, the rulebook says, can be used to denote their quantities in a situation where you might run out. Red is one, green is three, and purple is five. In theory, this sounds fine but in practice, it ends up being one extra piece of math that can really bog down the intended quickness of gameplay. I don't wanna to have to exchange a purple for two reds because we're out of greens while simultaneously trying to remember that I just raised a five to an eight so I can finally get my shield, which gives me one more potion back, but then I'll also complete my second order for my adventurer, which allows me to fill in another circle, and oh God, where on earth am I? You understand, I'm sure. These are smaller issues, to be sure, and what gamer doesn't have some bag of coins or gems or whatever else they lying around that they can use? Point being, I don't wanna to have to add components to the table just to play the game. Another handful of these potions would have been great. Merchants of Magic moves quickly from, oh, I just color in these circles every round, to, oh, if I color in this one, then I get a potion, which will let me change this die's value to the four I need to make this one work, and maybe next round I can grab that shield that's about to be passed to me. The amount of decision making round to round, to say nothing of your overall strategy for coins, will trigger some AP prone players, but generally makes for an absolutely delicious play session. For me, what really sings here is not only the tension of trying to sort out how to maximize my profits as a lowly craftsman, but as many of you know, I'm a sucker for a really nice table presence, which Merchants of Magic delivers on. If you're in the market for a game that can scale well to the eight player maximum here, offers some decent decision making, and is most importantly really and truly fun, then you've for sure found your calling here. Merchants of Magic aims to supplant your favorite roll and write with its combination of compelling art, manipulatable dice rolls, and crunchy decisions. Whether or not it does so is dependent on what you're looking for in a game of this weight class. Let's take a look at our checklist before I give you my final thoughts. In the box, rulebook clear and non-gender pronouns. The eight-page rulebook provides clear examples of gameplay, carefully going through each phase of the game in the proper order. While some shortcuts can be taken during gameplay, it's important to follow the rulebook carefully in your first game. It also uses gender-neutral pronouns they and theirs throughout. Iconography clear. While there is iconography in the game, it's almost always accompanied by the explanation of it on the card, so it's there simply as shorthand. You may need to remember that the incredibly clear potion bottle icon refers to the potion bottle tokens, but I'm sure that's well within your skill set. Packaging well done. Meh. While the box art is very nice and the overall design of the outside of the box looks great, once you open it up, it's completely utilitarian. Not bad by any means, but y'all know me. I love a sexy box. On the table, good representation. The only character art we find in the game is the woman of color on the cover and the eight included sponsored adventurers. Of those eight, it's an even split between men and women and still an even split with people of color. Component quality. While I'm certainly hoping that Rock Manor Games comes out with dry erase boards, the included pad of double-sided sheets will last a long while. The cards are sturdy thickness and very pretty to look at, and the wooden potion tokens are a nice addition where standard punch would have been fine. Replay value, very high. This game keeps getting asked for in our group, and overall game strategies vary pretty wildly among our players. Playing in an hour or so, depending on familiarity and player count, is the perfect time to start again once people get the hang of it, which will, admittedly, take a round or two before it really clicks, so be forgiving with new players. Fun to lose. Mostly. Merchants of Magic has that strange feeling that's a hallmark of Roll and Write games where it sort of feels like everyone thinks they're losing the entire time until someone isn't. The aforementioned hour-long playtime keeps total failure brief, and scores among people who understand the game well enough tend to be pretty tight. 
Given Merchants of Magic's somewhat understated announcement alongside the decline in the roll and write boom, you'd be forgiven for missing this one. However, now that you know about it, you owe it to yourself to grab this game if it's anywhere near your orbit. The gameplay is quick, but with plenty of decisions to make, replay value very high due to the varying strategies to explore, and it looks and feels great on the table. If Rock Manor puts together dry erase score sheets, this moves from the already coveted recommend position fully into the get hype area. At the very least, its ability to be played with eight people while being something I actually want to bring out time and again ensures it'll be a game night staple for our group for a long while. I'm Nicholas, reminding you to help protect the game population. Always leave your cards. <laughs>Hey everyone, if you liked our video, please hit that sub button and ring that bell for notifications. Check out all of our other offerings at goodluckhighfive.com and please consider becoming a patron of the channel over at patreon.com slash glhfmagic. It helps us keep making reviews, videos, podcasts, and you can become a member for any dollar amount. We're also always looking for new games to review. You can reach us at glhfmagic at gmail.com. You can follow me, Captain N, the Game Master, at CaptainNGM on Twitter and Instagram, and follow the channel at glhfmagic. Remember, please shop at your local game store whenever possible. Until next time, I'm Nicholas, and good luck. High five.